Welcome to Research in Brief. I'm Ryan Johnson from World at Work. Today I'm in the studio with Laura Seijin from Towers Watson. We're going to talk about creating an employee value proposition, a compelling employee value proposition. And this is based on some research that we've conducted with Towers Watson in the last couple of years. Let me make sure I get it right, Laura. Global Talent Management and Reward Study. But let's start with the definition of employee value proposition. How does that relate to total rewards, at least the way you see it? The employee value proposition, in our view, is the broadest definition of the relationship between the employer and the employee. We sometimes call it the deal. It includes not just total rewards, so the types of reward programs that employees ascribe value to, monetary value to, but it also includes things like the mission, vision, and values of the organization, it includes jobs, the way companies define jobs, their culture, so what a company's aiming for in terms of its desired culture and work environment, and even the people who work in the company. So it's the broadest definition of the employment experience, if you will, for an employee when they go to work every day. So it includes the total rewards elements, at least the way you guys think about it. Yes, so in our view, total rewards is one of the three main components the other two being mission, vision, values, and then the third being jobs, culture, and people. So total rewards is absolutely an important part of the EVP. I think for a lot of employees and companies alike, it's probably the most front of mind, it's probably the most visible, but it's just one of the three components. So let's talk about how to create a compelling employee value proposition. This research that Towers Watson and World at Work conducted together you split the data into four buckets. They're not exact quadrants or quartiles, but let's talk a little bit about that and then how a company might progress along the continuum. We were able through this year's research to define 10 characteristics that comprise or constitute what we would consider to be an effective employee value proposition and then within that, an effective set of total rewards ranging, everything, ranging everywhere from strategy through design and delivery of the total rewards programs. We did divide the participants in the survey into these four groups based on what kind of progress they've made across those 10 characteristics. So in the first group, which we just call group one, they haven't really started down the path. These are companies that haven't yet formally articulated an employee value proposition. Of course, they're delivering reward programs, they're, they have payroll, they deliver benefits, but they haven't thought about it in an integrated or holistic way. And the irony is, Laura, as well, we saw that some of the survey participants think that their company has an employee value proposition, even if the company doesn't believe they've articulated it, correct? Right. So when we ask employees, does your company have a formal employee value proposition, and we define what we mean by formal. A majority of employees say, yes, my company does. So, um, you know, one quick takeaway for employers is your employees think you have a formal employee value proposition, whether you do or don't. So there's an opportunity that's being missed in terms of managing the message around what you want to be as an employer and what total rewards programs you want to deliver if you haven't even taken that sort of first step of defining your formal EVP. So the second group? Second group are companies who have defined a formal employee value proposition. But beyond that, they've said, you know, as aligned with our EVP, what do we want to have as our total rewards strategy? And then if you think about all the different programs that comprise your company's total rewards portfolio, what are the specific objectives for each of those programs? How about the group three and then the group four, which is the very elite, right? The very elite is group four. Um, so group three has done everything group two has done. But then in addition to saying, you know, we've done a pretty good job articulating our EVP, they've also said to us in the research, we think we've done a pretty good job communicating it to our workforce and we think we've done a good job delivering on the promise. So the employee value proposition is so, in some ways is the employer's promise to employees. If you come to work for me, here's my proposition of value. So the group three companies have said, I've done a pretty good job delivering on that promise. To move to group four, you've done everything the group two and group three companies have done, but you also have said, you know, 
I don't think I can be all things to all employees. And I really need to think about the drivers of attraction, the drivers of retention, the drivers of engagement among what might be thought of as your critical workforce segments. And to the extent that those drivers are different for pivotal employee groups, you're tailoring your reward programs to meet the needs of those groups. And then lastly, you're more likely as a company, if you're in group four, to use analytics to test the effectiveness of your total rewards programs relative to those objectives you laid out when you were establishing your total rewards strategy. There's some very tangible things along the continuum here. I guess if I was a company in, in group, th uh, I'm sorry, one or two on the lower end, how would I get to groups three or four? What we found, and here's part of the business case for doing this, is that if you can go from group one to group four, and you don't have to do it in a year, but you are twice as likely as a company to report financial performance that is substantially above your peer group, and you're five times more likely to report that your workforce is highly engaged. So clearly, in my view, there's a business case for going down this path. That's the difference between the group one and the group four outcomes. But importantly, as an employer, you start getting a return on that investment even by moving from group one to group two. So simply by going through the formal exercise internally of saying, well, what, what do we want to be to employees? What do we want to be known for as an employer? What's our employee value proposition? That's the first step. What do we want to be known for as an employer? What's our proposition for coming to work here week in, week out, month in, month out? Do most of the companies that make it to the fourth group, do they know that they're in the fourth group? I mean, it's a small percentage. I think about 18% in the survey. Yeah, this is a new construct that we put together in, in the research that we did in 2012. Certainly any of the 1,605 companies that participated globally know they're there. Whether they had thought about it in those terms before or not, you know, we certainly have the evidence that they're achieving better outcomes. So I mentioned you know, the better financial results and the better employee engagement results. But we also found that as you go from group one to group four, you're less likely to report challenges attracting critical skill employees. You're less likely to report challenges retaining critical skill employees. So, you know, there's returns all around. Well, I want to thank Laura Seijin from Towers Watson and for Research and Brief, I'm Ryan Johnson.